All right, let's get started. So first up, uh, in case you are unaware, there is a final exam. It is on the 16th from 3 to 5 p.m. Uh, you will need something to write with and a computer. So please bring both of those things and start uh, Jupyter Notebook uh, in advance uh, using, you know, kind of the way you've been doing it all along. Um, I'll give more details on the final exam uh, on Tuesday's lecture. Um, so uh, one quick thing I'll say, somebody, or I think I, I may have already said this, but somebody asked if uh, the final exam would cover the whole semester. And basically the way I'm kind of putting it is like, Yes, because everything builds on everything else, um, but the focus will be on the stuff we did since the midterm, if that makes sense. So, you know, you, you have to know how to use table, even though we learned that like the first, you know, week or two. Um, but, you know, at the same time, uh, we're not going to focus too many of the questions on things that were specifically taught in the first half of the semester. Um, so I would definitely take a look at the midterm study guide, but maybe not, you know, with too much detail. Uh, and like I said, we'll talk more about it on Tuesday. Um, hopefully everyone had a good Thanksgiving um, and or at least a break uh, and uh, happy Hanukkah to anybody who's celebrating that, which I think started yesterday or late, late on uh, Sunday. Um, and uh, we have four lectures left, uh, as I said in Tuesday's lecture, which you know a lot of you weren't here. Um, this is, I think, the the kind of fun part of the course is kind of these last couple of uh, uh, you know the things we're talking about for the last kind of two weeks here, uh, which is where we start getting into real prediction stuff. All right, any questions? All right, cool. Um, oops. Uh, all right, so first up, uh, what we're talking about is prediction. Uh, and so, you know, for, for lack of a better term, prediction means guessing the future. And we, you know, it's, it's not very interesting unless the information is incomplete, right? If we already know what the future is, it's not much fun guessing. Uh, so, you know, some of the examples we'll give have, uh, you know, things that we already know because we want to test them or whatever. Uh, but, you know, in general, this becomes useful when you're trying to guess something in the future. So uh, there's a couple of keywords here, right? So outcome and individual. So individual here just means like, you know, if you think like our tables, like an individual row, not necessarily an individual like human. So not that definition, but the definition of just an individual thing. Um, and so what we want to do is kind of take one input or, you know, it, it kind of more advanced stages, multiple inputs maybe, uh, and get some sort of output. So, you know, what, what uh, data can go into predicting your grade in this class, for example, you know, homework scores, midterm, final exam, um, and that should give some reasonable prediction on what your overall grade would be. Um, and you know, we've been to doing tons of examples of these and we're gonna do another one now. Um, and the other thing is that uh, some of the techniques will actually reincorporate the outcomes you learn back into your pred prediction algorithms. But I don't know if we're gonna quite get to those kinds of methods yet or in this semester, um, but they are cool. All right, so let me run the big ones here. Um, so basically, uh, this first block up here is really just a bunch of helper methods. Um, most of them you could probably have written yourself. Um, you know, where, you know, where you can't, I wouldn't worry about it, but most of them, they're pretty straightforward. It's just to make uh, what we're actually talking about a little easier to deal with. Uh, so we're going to go back to something we talked about uh, a while back. Um, here, let me flip this to presentation mode, um, which was the parent height prediction uh, kind of information. Um, and so we're going to pare it down so it's just um, the kind of height information. So what's the average parent height? You know, do you take the two parents and then average the, their heights? And can we predict the child height based on that? 
and we know there's some problems with this as we talked about you know a few lectures ago uh but you know for the sake of this discussion don't worry about it uh, we're trying to prove the process not the individual example so we look at the mid-parent heights and we see the children um you know obviously this is hard data to look at kind of on its own so a good way to think about it or visualize it is using a scatter plot um, and we're specifically using scatter plots, which we haven't touched on in a while, um, because they kind of show us things about prediction, right? So, you know, we can start to see what this data looks like, and we can get at least a gut feel, excuse me, for how the predictions might work, right? So, moving on. All right, and so what we did before was we, and we're going to continue to mess with, is we're going to use um, the heights of people who are within, you know, 0.5 inches uh, from each other to use as a prediction for the, the children, right? So, you know, if we say, you know, I think the examples we use were around 68. Um, and so we're going to take a window between 67 and a half and 68 and a half, look at the children heights, and we're going to uh, use that to base on our uh, mid parent. So if we, you know, if we know that they're 68, then we look at that and we say, okay, well, on average, they're, I don't know, I'm just going to make this up here, but they're in this range, right? So we can make a guess that the child's height will be 65 or between, let's say, 65 and 70 inches. Um, so, but to do that, we will make an actual uh, set of predictions uh, while it runs, and then plot that on our scatter plot. Okay. Um, and does anybody notice anything significant about the gold here? What does it kind of look like? All right, it's mostly it's basically a line through the data right so um and if you look at this data right you can kind of see it right it does kind of look like it's going like this right um except when we look out here right it gets a little weirder right um any ideas why that might be any guesses as to, to what might be negatively affecting our our line here right because see how like our line, it starts to kind of get a little wobbly over here. Any ideas why that might be? Think about the mid parent heights that are in that range. We don't have as many data points, basically, right? So you know, as we get out here where people are getting out of band taller, right? Um, but we'd also see it on the short side too, right? Um, the vast majority of people are in kind of roughly the same height range. Uh, so our line's pretty good kind of in the middle and then kind of on the edges, it starts getting a little wobbly because we don't, we don't have good data there uh, to do our predictions from. Um, all right, so... And we'll go back to some slides. So what we're going to look at is associations. Okay, so in that picture, um, you know, what we saw in the in the graph here, um, would you refer to this? So we know, and this is one of those things where I, I think I don't know, I find it confusing, and I think a lot of people do. So we have a correlation here, right, between this and that, but it's not causal, right? We don't know that this will cause that. However, it doesn't mean they're not related. It just means one isn't making the other one happen. Okay, which is, like I said, I've always thought kind of a weird distinction. Um, so, but if you look at this yellow line and you look at our, our terms of uh, terms du jour, um, would you refer to that as a positive association or a negative association? We'll go back to the picture. There's a there's an old business joke about this. So, you know, you always want your business to do what? 
go up and to the right, right? You always want your revenue up and to the right. So a positive association is what we have here, right? Because basically they get more positive, right? Um, a negative association would be going the other way. So imagine a line going like that, right? And we'll show some more examples of that in a minute. Uh, how's my volume say? I can hear my voice isn't as loud as normal. Okay. Um, okay, so what are we looking for in the scatter plot? We're looking for shapes, okay? Um, however, uh, we have two big categories of those shapes. We have linear ones and we have nonlinear ones, okay? So things that look like a line and things that don't. And the reason we have these two broad swaths of kind of category of pattern is because the linear type are, first of all, very common. But second of all, we have a lot of really good tools for making predictions when the data is linear, okay? Our tools for when the data is nonlinear are less good, or maybe not less good as much as like less consistent, right? We can use this on a linear data set, we can kind of use the same set of tools pretty regularly. But as soon as you start getting the nonlinear rate, it's just like everything, right? It could be like a wave, it could be curves, it could be whatever. So it's a little bit harder um, to use like kind of one equation to get to them. So today we're going to mostly talk about linear uh, scenarios and what we can do to make predictions around linear scenarios. Um, so what we've been doing thus far is kind of we visualize it, right? Then we quantify uh, what we're doing. Um, and so we're going to do that a little bit here. Um, I always have to catch up on my cheat sheet. Um, and we're going to use a somewhat different example, which I don't think we've talked about yet. Um, but one of these, sorry, I thought it was on the same line. Um, so just uh, by way of explanation, so this is hybrid vehicles. Um, however, uh, at this point, it's literal. this data set is literally only hybrid. So there's no all electric cars in here. Um, which kind of skews what we might see if we looked at the same kind of data set like today, because this data set's a little old. Um, but, you know, we're basically on vehicle type, we have the year uh, it was, it came out, right? We have the MSRP, which is the uh, manufacturer's, yeah, uh, sorry, manufacturer's suggested retail price. I had my letters out of order in my head for a second. Um, so basically the price of the car before, you know, you go and try to negotiate with the dealer. Acceleration, um, you know, uh, this basically, for the sake of this graph, higher number here is better acceleration. So it, it starts from zero and gets to 60 faster. Uh, and then miles per gallon, okay, for anybody who is not American or English or I want to say Burmese, I think is the only other people who use it here. Um, that's, uh, that's a weird thing like a kilometer, but more. Um, and then we have the class, um, you know, so the type of car in this, okay? Just to kind of explain the data set a little bit. Um, and so what we might want to look at is the price of the cars um, descending, okay? So our most expensive car in here is this LX, uh, Lexus LS600, um, which is $118,000. Uh, and don't forget this data set is old. So that came out in 2007. So it's probably more than that now. Um, and does anybody notice anything interesting about, okay, so we're just looking at the top of the price range, right? Um, but if we look at kind of this more random data set up here, does anybody anything, notice anything interesting about the high price, highest price stuff and the miles per gallon compared to, you know, kind of what we saw randomly above that? especially on a hybrid car. If you're familiar with uh, hybrid car miles per gallon, even gas uh, cars and their miles per gallon, um, this, this might stand out for you. Does anybody notice anything about the MSRP and the, yeah. Right, so, so the cheaper the car, the better the gas mileage, which is weird, right? You kind of expect the opposite. Um, so I actually tried to look this up, but I couldn't find this car in like not a hybrid. Um, so I didn't spend too much time on it. Um, but what, what this says to me, right, is like, what is this thing non-hybrid? It's probably like five miles per gallon, right? 
um, which is insane. Um, and, you know, I, I still remember like her car over on the Honda Civic, non-hybrid gas car, right? It did something like 40 miles per gallon. Um, so that's kind of ridiculous. The reason tends to be is that the higher price the car, uh, it often can be heavier. That's one of the big things because they're bigger, they have more room in them. Um, they also can be, uh, they also much ha have bleh, much higher acceleration. So they do zero to 60 faster, which means you need a bigger engine and you burn more gas, et cetera, et cetera. So there's probably good reasons for it, but uh, I know it strikes me as odd. Um, so I thought I'd point it out. Um, but then we, what we wanna do is we wanna look at kind of the data against each other to kind of prove that theory. Um, and so we kind of do see there's pretty clear, right? Um, you know, as the, as the price goes up, um, the miles per gallon, you know, uh, or goes down, right? Um, so if you look at this though, what kind of pattern do you see between, or the relationship between miles per gallon and MSRP? Do you call that linear or nonlinear? All right, let's do left and right hand. So left hand linear, right hand nonlinear. See, almost all of you could have spoken up on it. So it is nonlinear, right? In the sense that there's, it, it's much more of a curve here, right? Like putting a straight line on this, it might work, but it's gonna be pretty messy, right? So um, we would think about this as a nonlinear graph and the reason we're showing you this right is because i want to i want you to, to recognize it right because i want you to be able to see them uh and be able to tell which one it is by kind of looking at it uh and so that you you know when you look at something like this and you go huh that looks like a curve and then you spend a whole bunch of time on math for it and you're like oh none of this works well surprise surprise it's because it's a curve uh so you know, kind of keep that in mind if you if you take a look at it first and it looks really wonky, you probably don't want to try some of these techniques against it because they probably won't work. So by way of comparison on the same data, we can look at acceleration versus MSRP. Um, and kind of what I was saying before is, you know, a higher price car tends to result in a higher acceleration. Okay. Um, and as you can see, right, this one's much more clearly some sort of linear, you know, uh, relationship between the two numbers. Um, and, you know, of course you have outliers, right? You have some weirdness, but, you know, the, the line's pretty, pretty clear. So it'd be helpful, you know, to try to get good at trying to recognize those. Um, so, what if we only look at one of the classes of cars to kind of scope our, um, oh, I was supposed to ask you all how to do that, um, to kind of scope our question down a little bit. So uh, why don't we look at just the SUVs, okay? Um, does everybody know what a, an SUV is? All right, sport utility vehicle, kind of like, it's, it's basically a, a, a fancy named station wagon um, because station wagon has bad associations. So, I don't know, maybe 30 years ago, they came up with the term sport utility vehicle, um, which essentially is a station wagon on steroids. Um, but we don't use station wagon anymore because, you know, it's bad. Um, all right, so we have about 39 SUVs in this data, or exactly 39 SUVs in this data. Um, and if we take a look at just the SUV data, um, we can see that we have actually a very similar graph, right? Obviously less data points, um, but it does seem to be pretty reflective of pattern, right? Um, you know, we noticed, you may notice a couple of things, right? The SUVs tend to be slower on acceleration, which kind of makes sense, right? Um, you know, a two-door coupe is going to be a lot lighter than, you know, uh, uh, an SUV that's built on a truck frame, and, you know, weighs three tons. So the acceleration just kind of out of the box, same exact engine, it's going to be better on the, you know, two-door coupe that's going to be on an SUV. So 
you kind of expect it to be a little steep down. Um, however, the price seems to be kind of all over the place, right? There, it doesn't seem to be that you know only only expensive cars are SUVs or only you know cheap cars are SUVs. All right, so what do you think is going to happen if we look at uh, miles per gallon and MSRP for the SUVs? Any ideas? Anybody know anything about cars? I know I don't. All right, so this one I think has a little bit more it, it kind of almost feels like a more linear relationship. Um, but this here messes with it, right? Like this really makes me think, oh, maybe not, right? Because we have a whole mess of data points there that, that would really screw up a line, right? Um, you know, even though it's like an inverse line. Um, so probably not still, um, you know, even though it does look more linear this is one where i kind of like err on the side of let's call it linear and, and do the math right all right so but i also want to point out that graph i believe yeah is pretty similar to this one i didn't realize they were out of order um so you know it still kind of has a lot of the same look but it's a smaller data set so one of the things that we want to be able to do, right, is it's very hard to compare this information to that information, right? So yeah, we have a similar data element here, but the accelerate this is miles per gallon, the acceleration are kind of wildly different. So what can we do to try to make them more comparable? And you can probably guess if you have the uh, notebook open. Any ideas? So we talked about this at least two lectures ago, maybe the third lecture ago as well. Any ideas, thoughts? All right, so we're going to try to convert them to standard units, okay? Um, because when we want to compare things, you know, it helps standard, right? So uh, to do that, we start using standard deviations. Um, so first, we have a little function that's going to basically do the standard unit conversions. Um, and then we're going to make a table with the miles per gallon standard units uh or as standard units and the msrp is standard units um and make a graph um and so if we look at this miles per gallon standard units um and notice this is still on the suv so if we compare it to this right the graph looks exactly the same the only thing that sometimes happens which doesn't really happen it does a little bit here um, you know, kind of the, the, you know, kind of the dots on the graph tend to shift a bit, right? So the overall pattern kind of remains the same, but they kind of move somewhere. Um, because what you've done is with the standard units, you've also shifted everything to be wrapped around uh, an X and Y of zero. So because you're standardizing it, right? So now zero is back to being in the middle of the graph. And like the other word, I don't even think zero is on the graph. Right, so we can move it back around, but the that graph is the same. It's just in it, you know, kind of moved around on the graph itself. And so we can do the same thing with the acceleration, and see how this one also looks the same. Right, it's just that now we've shifted the whole thing to be around zero, and I think it's this one that's a little on kind of that shift um i guess not um but yeah so yeah i think it was the miles per gallon one i just i i noticed that it looked different to me right uh at first because it's shifted so far up into the right but it's the same graph it's just in a different place all right so talking about the slides again 
All right. So what we want to do, right, is when we now have shifted these to standard units, we can try to actually measure that correlation between the two things, right? And we did this a little bit already, um, but we're going to call that the correlation coefficient. Um, and this was very hard to write on slides, so I, I apologize. But so we call the correlation coefficient, we call it R, almost always. Okay, so that R is a variable um, that you'll see kind of all over the place. Um, and so it's based on standard units, but it only works on linear associations. So if you tried to get an R for um, uh, whatever that was, the uh, miles per gallon and uh, you know MSRP, it, it's probably going to be actually what it's probably going to be is actually near zero. Okay, so if you look at these three bullets here, this is kind of really important because now we've moved to standard units. One is kind of the top of the stack. Okay, and so with one, we end up with um, a perfect line sloping up. I meant to throw in here like you know like a forty-five degree angle, right? So it's a straight line. If you ever have a correlation where the R is equal to one, it probably means you made a mistake somewhere, right? Because getting a perfect correlation is pretty unusual. Um, same with negative one, except reverse. So this is a 45 degree angle going down, okay? So that's what we mean by perfect straight line, right? So it's a straight line. In the positive case, it's going up and to the right. In the negative case, it's going down to the right. All right, and then if you get a zero, that's just uncorrelated, okay? And so now I'm going to show you some graphs that show you examples of these. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, so you can kind of see some pictures of them. So let's start with the easy one first. Um, and so if we get, so that function up above, right, is kind of taking a, a random table or whatever, um, making a scatter plot. Um, but so this is this is our this is our R one, right? Um, so notice it crosses through at zero, okay? Um, but it's a forty five degree angle up and to the right, okay? And then the negative one is obviously just the reverse, right? But notice it still cuts across the line, or the intercept is still at zero. Um, all right, anybody have any other numbers they would like to try? I wanna try zero, because I like zero. So this is what no correlation means, right? So, and you can see, right? It, it, yeah, you could draw a line right through here at zero and make predictions all day, they're just gonna be wildly wrong. And the best part is they'll be wildly wrong, either positive or negative, and you really don't know which. So that's what we mean by no correlation. Um, so somebody else give me a number to try. All right, 0.7. So what should it look like? Right, so kind of a messy up and to the right. And that's what we get. Um, and, uh, you know, like I said, it's just random data. If you were, if you were going to kind of do the same thing, you might get slightly different graph, but it looked basically the same. Um, all right, what other one should I try? Anyone? Somebody give me a number. Negative 0 0.3. All right, what do you think that's going to look like? Messy, yeah, right. So uh, almost messier, even though it technically shouldn't be. That might be have to do with the data. Um, so but I kind of want to show one that is also uh, like negative 0.8. Um, oops, not negative 8, negative 0.8. Um, right, so a little tighter, same idea, right? Uh, but you get the idea. So it's always between negative one and one, right? And 
you have a, um, you know, and if it's a negative value, basically it's going to go down to the right. And if it's positive value, it's going to go up. Uh, and the, you know, the closer you get to zero, uh, the more, here we'll do one more. Um, so like 0.1, um, the more, you know, ununiform it's going to get, right? More in, into a blob it's going to turn in. All right. So by way of, uh, you know, kind of, you know, important words or whatever, correlation coefficient, average of the product of X in standard units and Y in standard units. Um, I think we're going to calculate it a bit later. Um, but so one of the things that I'll just kind of point out there, right, is that when you, when you say a mathematical expression, you often say it in the reverse order of how you're going to execute it. Okay, so we start kind of with the end and move back to the left, right? So y in standard units, we figure that out. Then we figure out x in standard units. Then we take the product of the standard deviation of x and the standard deviation of y, and then we average the product of standard x, uh, standard deviation of x and standard deviation of y, and that will tell us how clustered it is around that straight line. All right. However, I feel like, oh, yeah. Um, my little uh, demo icon is in the wrong spot. Yeah, okay. So before we get to that, uh, we'll calculate R. So what we do is, um, we're just going to kind of make uh, you know a table to operate against, okay? Um, and so that's not completely random data, but you know, semi-random. Um, but as you can see, this is kind of the dot, uh, the points we're we're putting in our table, okay? So we're just kind of throwing a scatter plot in there so that we can kind of use it as our example. Um, so the first thing we do is we need to calculate the standard units for X and the standard units for Y. And, oops, I thought the function was right there, but I think it's up here. Wait, where is it? Oh. All Wait, is this a built-in function? Standard units? I thought it was. Yeah, I must have just missed it. Sorry, just. Oh, is it there? Okay. I thought I'd moved all the functions to the top. I'm always on the fence because good programming style is to put all of your functions kind of before they're used and tend toward the top um ah here it is okay it's like i thought we had it somewhere um okay so it's going to convert any array of numbers to standard units um so and we talked about this kind of on the on the slide right so whatever the input is we're going to take that minus the average of x right and because it's an array we're going to do a subtraction against the entire array then we're going to divide those uh, by the standard of x. So that's how we get these values down here. Um, so yeah, that's why putting the functions far away from the usage is a little difficult. Um, so, You know, I mean, there's not much to say here, except, you know, we, we've now shifted these to be on standard units. So they should be, excuse me, the, kind of the approximately the same distance away from each other, in a sense, um, except uh, using standard units so that they can be standardized across other uh, functions. Um, you know, but they should match up on kind of negative to positive, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Um, however, uh, it shifts our whole data set, um, in this case, I want to say kind of down into the left um, because we're moving the standard units. So if you look at the 
prior graph here, right? If we move all of these things to kind of over here, this currently doesn't have any negative numbers. So, but if you kind of shift it down into left, it will. Um, and so I think oh, we had a graph of that one too. Um, yeah, so why, okay, so it's gonna kind of shift it uh, down into left to kind of get it into standard units, but then what we want to do is uh, try to even it out. So we're going to take the product of those standard units uh, by bringing them together and then take the average of those. And that's how we're going to get to our R, which should be here. All right. And so now we have an R for this data set of 0.617, right? So and I don't know if we drew a 0.6, right? But we know that if we do scatter, so it should look something like this, right? Except obviously with a lot less data um, because it's a 0.6. So if we take that prior work and we kind of shove it into one function, then now we can do a correlation or our calculation, right? For any uh, values that we kind of put in. Uh, so we give it a table and then two column labels, right? And then we can just calculate it without having to do it by hand. Um, so now we do the same data set, right? And we get the same value. So this is just the piecemeal, you know, kind of going back here. Oops. Are you gonna? So we do the y in standard units, then the x in standard units, then we take the standard deviation, so both, oops, and then multiply them together, and then we take the average um, of the products. And so we end up with a function that looks like this, so that we don't have to do it every time. Um, then, So let's see. Um, so then if we wanted to apply that to the SUV data, right? Um, wait, am I in the right place? I keep getting lost today, sorry. Um, I am not, that's okay. Yeah, so if we want to apply it to the SUV data, they may have a theory about how we would do that to the SUV data. If we wanted to do, um, let's see which one I had first here, uh, miles per gallon versus uh, manufactured suggested retail price for MSRP. Now that we have our handy function, right, it's really easy. Yeah. Yeah, easier said than done, apparently. Uh, let's do core. So SUV, and then our SUV. Then we're going to do MPG, and then, oh my goodness. Sweet. Uh, and then MSRP. Don't know why I can't type today either. Oh, you're right. Yeah, I want the actual object. Um, so for that one, so now we know we have a, uh, a correlation coefficient or R of 0.66 or negative 0.66, sorry, um, which you know, if you go back to our graph way up here, with miles per gallon, all right, negative 0.66, you know, okay, I can see that. Um, and then if we did the other side, nothing works there. All right, 
So then we could do correlation of SEV. It really wants to not do SEV today. And then we can do Assuming I typed everything correctly. All right, so that one gives us a 0.486. So with the acceleration in MSRP, that was the one we were a little less sure on. Um, but with the SUV data, it appears that, um, what was it, zero, 0 0.46, I think you said? Um, so, you know, it is starting, you know, it, it does seem to think we're getting some sort of correlation. Um, it's not as strong, right? Because it's a lower number or it's a number closer to zero. So if we think, where we go? So it's now, you know, so this is a stronger relationship, right? So even though it's a negative number, it's further away from zero. This is a weaker correlation because it's closer to zero, even though it's positive. So it is going up and to the right, but we think it's going to be not as strongly correlated um, because it's only you know, 0.48 or 0.5. Um, and this one is almost 0.7 or negative 0.7. Sorry, I keep dropping a negative. So that tells us a little bit more about what's going on um, and that maybe there is a relationship there that we can um, uh, leverage, right? So what starts to get interesting, right, is that if you reverse the axes, our, our <laughs> this is hard, our R remains the same, okay, or nearly, um, you know, anything that's different is probably just a calc. Um, so, which, you know, basically, so it's like the relationship kind of works in both directions, okay? So we can look at it and we can still say it's a 0.61 correlation um, when we reverse those two axes and we can make pretty pictures um, where we have kind of the two in reverse. And, you know, and so if, there, if the correlation is there, it's still gonna work uh, even when we reverse it. Um, not the same. Yeah, so apparently I'm going to calculate that twice. Um, even when we switch the axes around, uh, the, the R remains the same. All right. Uh, this is just kind of a useful piece of data. Um, the thing to remember here, though, is that um, about this is like, make sure you know what axes you're using for what, right? Um, because it's going to be really weird to predict the miles per gallon when you accidentally revert, uh, sorry, you're gonna predict the uh, MSRP uh, when you have the, uh, if the Y axis is actually acceleration, right? So you just gotta be sure you know which one you're doing, but they should, the correlation should work. It's just, it's gonna change the units, right? It's gonna change what the data set looks like because um, the data is different. All right, so if we go back over here. All right, and then so, you know, I kind of alluded to this, right? Uh, you know, this this does not mean causation. It just means that there's a correlation. Nonlinearity can be uh, screwball. Outliers can make it screwy. And then ecological correlations. Um, but let's talk about those with pictures. Um, make it a little easier. So, if we have something that's nonlinear, right? So that is definitely nonlinear. It's a nice big curve. Um, then we try to do the calculation of the correlation, right? Um, and so, so this one is is less like a mistake in a sense, right? The math will will show you that you're wrong, right? Um, so you know. But if you look at this, you should say, I don't need to do the math on this, right? But for some of them, when they're close, you want to think about, you know, how close is it to zero if you want to actually calculate it. Um, and 
how close is acceptable to be useful to whatever you're trying to accomplish. All right. Um, and that's why, to some extent, we're going to get into some more sophisticated ways of doing this as well uh, to make it better. Um, and then you also get outliers, um, which can mess up the data. Um, which is this example. Um, so this one over here, right? The thing that's the thing we want to point out here, right, is like on the first one, this is a perfect one, right? Um, you know, perfect 45 degree angle, whatever. We introduce one more point, okay, just one, and it completely breaks the correlation. Okay, so um, obviously a little bit of a contrived example. There's only five data points, but the idea here is that, you know, outliers can have a much greater effect on your, uh, you know, on the correlation than you might realize. Uh, and so it's something you want to kind of be aware of, control for, understand, whatever. Um, because like I said, you know, in this somewhat contrived example, just one data point, completely throws out the correlation. All right. Um, then the last one, which is kind of a weird terminology, so this is going to load this data set. Um, and so this gets into a conversation about when is it appropriate to aggregate things, OK? Because if you look at this data set, right, um, this is by US state, right, um, and then participation of the students, whatever. Um, this is their reading score, their math score, their writing score, and then this combined score. So if we look at a core, uh, sorry, a scatter plot of the math score, and we look at a scatter plot. Or, and the correlation of the mass score. So we're we're correlating these two things, right? So the critical reading versus math. This is saying, you know, if you're a better reader, you will do better at math. But right at a state level, that tends to be true. Okay. So when you talk about a state level, right, you know. Uh, hundreds of thousands, millions of people. So you might get a correlation like this, but does that mean if you go and like talk to any individual that this correlation is likely to hold up? It's a lot shaky, okay? Because you're, you're aggregating and then trying to apply it to a much more unique kind of component. If you did the same kind of thing with all the individual students, you know, for all I know, maybe you'll get the exact same thing. I have no idea. But more than likely, right, you're going to get a quite a different relationship between the students on an individual basis than maybe this nearly perfect correlation. Okay. Um, and, you know, so it's just make sure when you're thinking about the data set you're looking at that the where you're aggregating and, uh, you know, or, or whatever you're doing to the data that you're, uh, and we've talked about this a few times. It's like, remember the units you used to create your data and your, you know, either a prediction or, cor you know, correlation or scatter plot, I mean, whatever it is. If you don't keep track of what the units were, which is completely lost in this graph, right? There's nothing here that says by state, okay? So this would be a great graphic to use on the nightly news to prove something completely wildly inaccurate, right? So just keep that in mind. You know, at least for me, I like to put labels in here to tell me whatever it was because I'm dumb and I will forget, okay, whatever it was I did if I see this out of context. So I recommend that you do that as well. The other thing that happens too is that, you know, let's say you write a fancy blog post about, you know, reading versus math. <clears throat> and so you put this graph in your blog post about whatever it is you're talking about. Somebody's going to want to just pick that up and use it, and they may use it inappropriately, and then cite you, right, to say, hey, you know, this person wrote this. 
even though they came to a completely false conclusion. Again, you know, if you put labels in the actual graphic, then it's harder to mess that up. And it, it may not even be like by design, right? It could just be, you know, whoever the reporter was didn't know what they were talking about. All right, let's see, do we have another sample in there? No, okay. But it is kind of cool that with a real, like I believe this is a real set of data that we did actually get a correlation that is nearly one, which I think is kind of entertaining. Um, and, and may indicate why it's not a very valid correlation. All right, so we're gonna do more left and right hands here. Um, so starting with A um, and uh, like, let me look at this. So we're going to talk about question A, which is left hand, right hand. Okay. We're not comparing each of these blocks to each other. So if you think the, in A, that the left graphic has a higher value of R, raise your left hand. And if you think it has a, if the, right hand side has a higher value of r raise your right hand and so that i avoid mistakes i will also look at my cheat sheet um which i of course i didn't label with left and right but one and two so that makes it more confusing all right someone who's holding up their right hand you want to explain it why you think this this one has a higher value of r than this one Anybody? Yeah, we'll have you. Right. Right. So um, I like to use the technical term blobby. Um, so this one looks more blobby to me, and this looks more like a line, right? So, um, and you know, but you're right, right? It just, you describe more kind of outliers. Um, so more, uh, you know, kind of variability in the data. Uh, so the right-hand side was correct uh, on that one. So why don't we do the same thing with B? Um, which one do you think has the, and remember I said the higher value of R. So um, this would be left-hand and this would be right-hand. This is a little bit of a trick, a trick question. Correct. No, not absolutely. Right. Higher on the number line. All right. So, sorry. So, this is left hand and this is right. Um, so, somebody who's got their right hand up, want to explain the answer? And why it's a trick question? I'm going to call on you. Okay, so it's closer to zero. Um, so even though this is a negative correlation, right? Um, and so in, as an absolute value, it probably has a higher value. As a negative value, it's less than whatever this is, which is closer to zero. So that is correct, the right hand side. All right, how about C? So left hand side, right hand side. All right, I'm calling you on the back with your left hand up in the red jacket. Uh, I feel like the left hand side Yeah, that's good. Any other reasons? Yeah, these are what say to me, this is probably closer to zero, right? And because it's both of them are positive, Right, closer to zero is going to be a lower value of R. Um, so, um, otherwise, like I kind of, like I feel like the blobbiness versus line or whatever, like they're similar, but these, especially that there's three of them, that's what starts to throw me off. All right, uh, and then D. So, this 
So let's see, left, right. Um, and I will point out there's a weird outlier here and a weird outlier here in case you can't see them. <coughs> All right, so left-hand side would be a lower value of R and right-hand side would be a higher value of R. All right, uh, how about in the next section back, left-hand side, Grace Richard? Not that I can see any faces because of the mass. Um, so the left one is more negative. And so which one of these do you think has a higher value for R? The right one. Okay. Sorry. I thought you were saying the opposite. Um, okay. So even though this one has a lot more outliers, right? I mean, this has a lot more outliers, so it's pushing it more towards zero, right? Even though this one looks more uniform. So just keep in mind, right? A, a negative value just means it's going to go down and a positive value means it's going to go up. I know I looked at this for a minute and was kind of like, ah, and then I thought about it and I was kind of like, oh yeah, all right, there's a lot, there's a lot of messiness in these edges here. So they're probably going to push it towards zero, even though there's a big chunk in the center. Cool. Um, so this is kind of funny. Um, this I, I gladly stole from data eight. Um, so this is chocolate consumption correlation with Nobel laureates. So the more chocolate you eat, according to this graph, uh, the more likely you are to have a Nobel laureate as a country. Um, what I particularly like is, I think it's the or something. Uh, this, in case you weren't sure, this was produced by the Swiss. So unsurprising. Um, so, you know, I mean, there's a correlation, right? But it's not causal, right? It, it, may, it may be true. You may be able to predict it, um, but it's certainly not causal. So uh, just be careful of those two. And of course, be careful of the Swiss offering chocolates, um, unless you want a Nobel Prize. All right, makes sense? All right, cool. All right. So uh, bad joke of the day, uh, we're going to talk about prediction. Are you surprised that we're going to talk about a different kind of prediction? Um, so um, basically what we want to do is, okay, now let's try to formalize some of the prediction stuff we did early on, right? Um, and we you know, we went through and we calculated this. I, I kind of got ahead of myself, but I kind of explained this already. Um, and we say, you know, hey, we, we look at the surrounding um, dots around the, excuse me, the place we're looking for, and then maybe we can make a prediction about somebody else in that same space. So if we take somebody random whose mid-parent height is 68 inches, um, then you know we can try to guess where if we take the average of all the stuff that's in the middle, or you know, a, a half inch on either way. Uh, if we take an average of all of that, we'll get a height of about whatever that is, 67, something, um, maybe 66. Um, and we can kind of do that over and over and over again, right? And we can actually get this dotted line that we talked about before. Um, and does anybody know what this method might be called that we did somewhat informally, but it is a very well-known, highly, you know, very valuable, useful, high quality practice. And I alluded to it a couple of times, but I tried not to use the actual word uh, to make it harder. Let me know what this is called. It's exactly what it sounds like. That's that's what you get. This is how you get that. Any idea? All right, so nearest neighbor prediction. Okay, so you look at the neighbors, 
whichever ones are nearest, and you do a prediction. Um, this thing that we're seeing with the yellow line, right? That's the best. Well, really, the best fit line is the line that goes through the yellow dot. So maybe I should ask the question on the prior slide. Um, so uh, basically, so you group each of your x values with similar nearby x values. Then we average the corresponding y values for each group. And then for each x value, the prediction is the average of the y values in its nearby group. Um, and then the graph of these predictions is the graph of averages. It's usually referred to this. OK, so. Um, this yellow line is the graph of averages. And then, yeah, and so if the relationship between x and y is linear, then the points in the graph will fall mostly on a line. Um, and, you know, you start to get messy because of outliers, you know, or whatever, but in general, they'll kind of fall mostly on a line. And so that's the near, nearest neighbor regression. Um, and like I said, very commonly used high quality technique um, that we kind of went towards, right? Um, so talking a little bit about uh, kind of the math terminology for this. Um, so this is a scatter plot with an R value of 0.99, okay? So can anyone here tell me what the slope of the line that would go through these dots would be? All right, we know it's no, nearly 45 degrees, but what is it in terms of a slope? Does anybody remember how to do this? Oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, so the, the slope is really close to one. Um, and so <clears throat> that slope is basically, you know, when you're looking at it visually, it's kind of easier because it's basically you take one step up and you go one step over. Um, and, you know, so for a step up, it's going to be the same place, right? You just kind of go by step by step. So it's one block each time. Um, and then one of the things we'll point out here, even though when we're talking about doing things to standard units, um, it's always the same. But this, when it crosses zero, is referred to as the intercept. Okay, you may remember this from you know earlier years math. Um, and then, does anyone know what the function is for uh, this line? Like I said, you may remember this from earlier, Matt. Um, so this is y equals x, okay? And very, it, it's like really obvious, right? So when you have an x of one, oh, oh, I just threw it over there, but when you have an x of one, right, then you know that the y is going to be one. So they're always going to be equal, okay? It will also be true for one point, you know, one point two seven six four one whatever. It's going to be the same, okay, on the y axis. That's what, it, uh, what a function of x equals y means. X is always equal to y. Uh, a function of x equals y always has a slope of one, but may or may not have an intercept at zero. Wait, where does it always have an intercept? It always has an intercept at zero as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, all right, and then our zero um, is kind of like, the reverse, right? So uh, basically, this is um, y equals zero. Okay, that's the function for this line. Okay, it's always zero because if you put a line through here, you just put it in the middle because you can't really do anything else. That's why the correlation is so bad. Um, and so y is just equal to zero. The slope is equal to zero, and it just goes across. And so the intercept is also zero. Um, uh, like I said, the standard unit gets the intercept is less interesting because it's always zero. All right. So, oh wait, no, I have pictures. Give picture. Oh boy, you come back. Here.
So we're going to pull this example basically uh, up there somewhere. We have a function that will generate a table that has an R value of what we passed into. Okay. So R table will give us a table back with 0 0.99 uh, R value. Um, and so in this case, we're just going to show three values out of it um, just to kind of give you a sense of what it is. But it's all in standard units, so it's all going to be around zero, right? Um, uh, but it, you know, if you actually you didn't do it, so why don't we just show it? Um, if we look at a scatter plot of it, and we hit the right keys, it's going to look like that, right? Which is what we expect um, because we're generating a sample. We're kind of not, you know, it's it's 0.99, right? So that's why it's not a straight line, it's, but it's nearly straight. <clears throat> then, um, yeah, and so just kind of another, yeah, I don't know why I put that in there twice. Okay, whatever. Um, all right, so then what we start to do is we think about that nearest neighbors, okay, so how can we actually uh, figure out what the nearest neighbors are? Um, and so this is where it gets a little tricky um, because, you know, this 0.25, right, is a little bit arbitrary and somewhat based on the data set, but we can get an idea of how nearest neighbors works using this, and we can think about what we want to do for that kind of data set later. And... So... If we look at the nearest neighbors for this value of negative 2.25, um, then what we do is we look at column Y, right? Or if we look at the, the Y value, and we can see that we get negative 2.1, okay? Because remember, we shifted the whole thing to be standard units. That's why we're not talking about inches anymore. Instead, it's going to be all kind of around zero um, so that we can do a little bit cleaner predictions um using standard units and then keep thinking i have stuff that's going to print that doesn't because in like the next line or whatever um so then what we can do is we can use that function okay to actually make a line or closer to the line and we can start to get here's all of our nearest neighbor predictions so what we're doing here is we're taking kind of the actual data set and overlaying what we would have predicted the value would be, okay? Because ultimately what we care about here is just the prediction. We don't actually care about the real data set uh, except to inform the prediction. And then, let's see if this is going to be, not take all day. Why is this doing so? Yeah. All right, so, now we have what you referred to earlier as kind of the best fit line, which is what this blue line is, is that we're actually going to draw a line versus the yellow dots, which are the predicted values. Okay. So now this blue line has like mathematical rules around it, right? It has a slope, it has an intercept, um, it has a function. Uh, and so because we're we're declaring that it's going to fit this line. Um, and so what we want to do is we want to be able to figure out what that should look like or what that would be. Um, let's see what this does. Oh God, this is taking forever. All right, so, and kind of by way of simple example, if we have an R value of zero, right? So we generate a table that has an R value of zero, then we can kind of do the same kind of thing, except it's not going to work very well eventually. So, as we talked about before, actually, let me just run the other one. Oh, no, it doesn't have the, I thought I had the fit line there too. Um, so, our predicted Ys are this yellow line, right? Basically, a straight line going across. So we'll pretty useless. Then we can also, oh my goodness, 
It's hard to line up on the keyboard. I just want to finish this last little bit before we go. Um, so this time we're going to actually create a table with an R value of 0.5. And we're going to have some nice cutoff. Okay, so that's kind of what you'd expect, right? It's not perfect, but it's definitely, you know, still got a pretty good trend line to it. Um, and then, oh, I did run the other one. Um, yeah, and so if we draw a line through it based on our uh, nearest neighbor predictions, we're gonna get this red line here. Um, and then kind of by way of explanation or whatever to make it more obvious, um, we also draw this black line just so you can see it's like, you know, one and a half is going to hit about one and a half because it's not that far off of a slope of zero um, or slope of, sorry, slope of one. Um, but I think that's the wrong. I want to show. Yeah, so yeah, we uh, maybe I'll come back to this next time. Um, but you know what we did here was we just kind of drew drew a slope of line. Uh, sorry, we just drew a line of slope one um, through here because it kind of looked roughly right. Okay. However, if we look at actually trying to take the nearest neighbors, and I was supposed to set this up better, I apologize. Um, but if you look at the nearest neighbors. This yellow line, right, or yellow set of dots, is not actually quite this. Okay. And so um, it means that our, our guess at the R value is kind of incorrect. Uh, so, and which I kind of gave away because I set it up poorly. Um, so, what we actually need is a line that's running through as a 0.5 R value. So in other words, we need one that has a slope of 0.5 because that's actually gonna fit our yellow dots a lot better. Um, like I said, we're out of time, so I kind of rushed this and set it up poorly. So I'll talk about it more next time. Um, but uh, hopefully you get the idea, right? Is that, you know, we use this nearest neighbors mechanism we get a pretty good idea of where its friends are based on averages, then we can try to run a line through it. But the thing is, we can eyeball it, and sometimes we're right, but it's better if we can actually calculate it uh, to figure that out. Whoever has the appendix case can you run it? Maybe, maybe bad joke. It's in the back. I've got everybody, but like. I, I don't.